Hello everyone, this is Ilonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. Hello everyone, this is Ilonzo. Want to know how to get your first cloud job? Then please register for our webinar. We'll teach you everything that you need to know and answer your questions along the way. Hope to see you there. My name is Richard Fur, and I can say I am cloud hired. That yes, come and join and get cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. Hey, go, go cloud architect family. I'm cloud hired. Well, I'm cloud hired, guys. So I'll just say I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired. I'm cloud hired thanks to go cloud architects. It worked for me, and now I'm cloud hired. Because because of Google Architect program, I am cloud hired. See! I am cloud hired. Thank you, Mike and the Glowcloud team. Welcome everyone. It's Mike and Alonzo today. And we're here to answer any type of cloud computing career questions you have. So you can build the perfect cloud computing career. 
Maybe your goal is to be a cloud architect or a cloud engineer, or you'd like to know the difference between a cloud architect versus a cloud engineer. Maybe you want to know how to get your first cloud architect job, your first enterprise architect job, your first network architect job. That's why we're here. See, I know that the shortest distance between two points is a straight line, and I want to make sure you have a tech career that you absolutely love. I've been working in tech now for, well, it's actually more than 25 years now. It's kind of scary to think about it. And I've spent more than two decades, over 20 years, helping people get their first tech job, get promoted in tech, win the tech interview, and I'm here to help you. I've watched people, literally speaking, spend years of wasted efforts by learning the wrong things. And I want to know that we can help you get to your goals as fast as possible. Because let's face it, time's money. And time is also our most precious commodity. We only have so much of it. And when our time's up, our time's up. So I want to make sure that you live every day like it's your last and build a career that you will love, one that'll pay you more than you've ever dreamed possible so you can live a life of your dreams, take care of your family, and have an incredible lifestyle. And that's why we're here. So today, come and ask us your career questions so we can help you get to your goal. Because I want you all cloud hired, as we like to say around here. You know, this morning, I got another reference check for one of my students named Danny. He got his first cloud architect job, and it's his first tech job. Another one of my students sent me a message today, and he says to me, Mike, I'm working on these two jobs right now. I'm on the final interview for one. You think it would be a good one for me to take? And of course, it's an architect job, So, and it's his first one in tech. So the point is, is all of you can have a cloud computing career of your dreams, but you've got to know how to get there. And that's why we're here. So please ask us your questions so we can help you. I've had single phone conversations with people and they've gotten a $50,000 raise like that. I've coached people through interviews for jobs. I've helped people with no background get cloud architect jobs every single day of the week. And that's why we're here to help you too. So welcome and please ask us your questions. Uh, why don't you welcome everybody to Alonzo. Alonzo is my chief marketing officer, but he also is a great cloud architect. He's worked on the cloud. We trained him. Got a job, got him a job on the cloud. I'm like, you got to come back, Alonzo. I need you back on my team. So Alonzo can also help you. So Alonzo, why don't you say hello to everybody? And welcome people as well. Well, definitely, Mike. Um, it's always a pleasure just interacting and engage with everyone who are who's looking to become a cloud architect. And remember, it does not matter where you come from, but we also are definitely focused on your trajectory and where you can be with our training. So we welcome you. We are thankful for you. Um, as well, I've, I've done cloud architecture. I am focused on on the marketing and on the brand portion of it. So um, we definitely want to emphasize that it's not just about the tech. It's about who you are and how you can, how you can exemplify uh, your personality and maximize your brand to efficiency to become a great business-minded architect. So we're looking forward to answering your questions. Again, welcome from everyone from all over the world. Please don't be shy. Lay them all out for them so we can answer your questions and get you where you need to go as quickly as possible. Yeah, and I'm going to key in on that. Like Alonzo said, it's not just about the tech. It really isn't. I don't care what your career is. If you're a cloud architect, it's about 50% tech, 40, 50% tech, 50 to 60% some everything else. If you're an enterprise architect, it's about 80% business and 20% tech. Whatever the case is, it's all about being what the hiring manager wants. And I'm going to tell you right now, hiring managers want a lot of things, but they want someone that can actually do the job, which is different than what we see almost every day. I can find you somebody that can do 10 other people's jobs, but to actually do their job, boy, that's pretty tough. Hiring managers want somebody they can trust, someone that's energetic, enthusiastic, and passionate about the work, someone that brings out the best in others, someone that's a team player and someone who's willing to go above and beyond to help that company and help that team succeed. But let's face it, who would you hire to be on your team? So let's answer your questions. I know there's tremendous confusion between what cloud architects do and what cloud engineers do, for example. I know there's a lot of questions on how AI will help some careers like the architect career. And while AI will hurt certain careers, like engineering careers, and if you want to know how to navigate that, we're here. I'm going to tell you tomorrow night, we're going to talk about jobs that you can get hired for in a tech recession. And I'll tell you what, I've gotten hired in recessions. My students are getting hired in recessions. 
and you can too. So the point is, is that's why we're here. We're tech career experts, so ask us your questions. And that way, we can help you build your cloud computing career. Tyrone, any questions in the background for you to put up? So we can begin answering people's questions. Okay, Alonzo is muted as he's trying to read okay. off. Um, sorry guys, I'm a project manager with hopes to trans, uh, transition into the cloud, AWS to be exact. I have loved your videos, but had a hard time following because I didn't have an IT background and sometimes terminologies, what's the other portion of it? Uh, uh, knock me off. I would love it if you could be kind enough to list all of your videos in succession for a cloud newbie looking at getting up to becoming a AWS solutions architect professional. Thank you. Okay, Afosa, I'm going to give you some guidance here. Yeah. If you want to transition to be a cloud architect from a project manager, you're going to have to learn how to become a cloud architect. And I'm going to tell you right now, the certified solution architect professional is not enough. What percentage of it is, I tell you, it's almost 5%. I'm also going to tell you that there is no way with just watching our YouTube videos would you ever get enough to get this job. And here's the reason why. We provide as much as we can for free, but we can't teach this via YouTube. So Afosa, we actually are probably use the least technical terminology than you could possibly imagine inside of our videos. So Ernest, what I want you to do is join us on Thursday and get into the how to get your first cloud job webinar. Also in the description of this video, there is also one, but I'm gonna give you some guidance. If you don't know the terminology, and we don't use any jargon at Go Cloud of Careers and Go Cloud Architects, it's because you don't know the underlying technology. And if you don't know the underlying technology, you will never be able to do the job. Now you'll be able to pass the exam. I can show you thousands and thousands and thousands and tens of thousands, even 100,000 AWS certified people that know absolutely zero about cloud architecture. So it's not that you're gonna ever be able to do this in succession off of YouTube videos. So if I was to, I'm gonna give you two mm -hmm. options. Option one is we have training and option two is that I'm gonna give you all the things that you need to learn right now. Now, <clears throat> you're not gonna get this kind of education in a video. That's why in our courses we do live training. Now you could get at least 50% of this out of reading Afosa, and I'm gonna give you that information. Now the reading list that I'm going to give you is between 25 and 50,000 pages just for the tech. And it's gonna be about 20,000 pages or so for the business piece as well. But I want you to understand it. Now I'm gonna also tell you this. I've gotten lots of people hired with zero certifications. And I get a tremendous number of students come to us with multiple certifications that we must train or retrain the architect to become architects. So I'm gonna give you the list. Afosa, on the networking side, you must learn BGP. If you don't know BGP, you won't be able to connect your systems to the cloud. If you don't have routes to, to it, um, you won't be able to reach anything. The entire thing will not work. So you're going to need to learn Border Gateway Protocol. Now you can, there's a free book that we wrote, which will give you a, got some guidance into that. There's also the RFCs that are out there from the Internet Engineering Task Force. And there's also a really good book. It's only about 500 pages from Bassam Halabi on BGP. That is your BGP module. You can learn it from us in our training program, or you can go through those. With the Internet Engineering Task Force RSCs, our BGP document, and the document from Bassam Halabi. Now next, you need to understand interior gateway protocols as well. So if you are in our class, we would teach you. If you're not in our class, you can learn them to a degree by reading the book uh, Routing TCP IP from Jeff Doyle. Uh, it's about 2,000 pages or so, but it will teach you your interior gateway protocols to understand. Now, also, you're going to need to understand WAN technologies. And unfortunately, you're not going to be able to, you're going to ha have to know which ones to use as an architect. When do you use a private line? When do you use a VPN? When do you use software-defined networking? And when do you use SASE? The reality is you're going to need some networking training for that. We provide it to all of our students, but you're going to need to know that. Now, also, you're going to need to understand switching because they're switching in VLANs. And you know, there's lots of ways you can do that. You can get it from our training, or you could go through the Cisco CCNP curriculum, and they cover switching there. And But 
It's not the curriculum in CCNP where they teach you how to configure the switches in the VLANs. It's understanding the knowledge of how they work. So keep that in the back of your mind. So by understanding switching, that means VLANs, VLAN tagging, VLAN trunking, spanning tree, rapid spanning tree, port channel, ether channel, link aggregation groups. Now you're also going to um, um, going to have to learn next the DNS, DHCP, ARP, and proxy ARP. Now those are your networking things. You can learn a lot about that from the book Stevens TCP IP, as well as the Internet Engineering Task Force RFCs. And you also, while you're at it, should learn um, the IEEE signaling things for Ethernet um, because that's a pr primary WAN technology and whatever we're using. Now that we're done that, folks, so you're going to need to learn the data center. So you, obviously, if you took our course, we would teach you, and you can sign up for the course. Ch Tyrone will put a link to this in the video. And you need to understand servers and server virtualization. So you're going to need to learn server processor architecture and GPU architecture and, and DRAM architecture. And, and, and storage architectures just for the servers themselves because you can't build the server or design a server if you can't do it right. So you're going to need to understand that. You can get that. You can find that information on the internet. But you got to understand it correctly. Then after that, you need to understand servers and server virtualization because everything we do in the cloud is a virtual server. And, you know, it, it's in our training, but if you're not with us, you can go to VMware. There's a couple hundred pages on that. You can also go to KVM and read the QEMU documentation and read Citrix's Zen documentation, and that'll give you the server virtualization. Now, AFOSA. Next thing you need to understand is containers and container orchestration. So you can get some of that documents and knowledge from, uh, from VMware, some of it from IBM OpenShift, some of that information you can also get from uh, uh, Kubernetes and some of that information from Docker. When you're done learning those things, you're going to need to learn about storage area networks. Good news. You can get that information from our training, or you can obviously get it from Dell EMC and IBM. There's lots of storage area information in there. And from there, you're going to need to learn about RAID and all kinds of RAID arrays. You can get that information from us, obviously. You can get some from Weston Digital, some from Samsung, um, some for the RAID card makers. But you're going to have to understand that because there's a lot of RAID because cloud storage is really slow. Now, after that, you're going to need to understand the storage area networks, block storage, object storage, file storage. Again, Dell EMC can give you some information. Now you need to understand load balancers and load balancer architectures and how to design them, not just the silly business they teach in the Certified Solutions Architect Professional. Now, from there, where are you going to get that? In our training, obviously. But if you're not inside of our training, um, you can get some from F5. Um, they've been making load balancers forever, a couple hundred pages, and then you'll understand load balancers. Now, outside of that, you're going to need to understand databases, no SQL databases, relational databases, and of course, we would teach that. If you're not with us, you can read the documentation from MySQL. Uh, you can read it from Oracle's database, Microsoft SQL. And that'll kind of give you the information you need on the relational databases. Now, in the no SQL databases, you can read all about them on Apache Cassandra's website, as well as MongoDB's website, and how to scale them. Now, next, we're getting in the security territory, a couple, four or 5,000 more pages of reading here, because you're going to have to understand how to design a security policy. Of course, we teach this to all of our students. And then we're, you're going to have to understand how to assess the organization's security needs, how much security protection they actually need, for example. Then you're going to have to understand next generation firewalls, intrusion detection, intrusion prevention systems, VPN concentrators, to say the least. Encryption strategies, for example, and identity and access management systems such as Active Directory. Now, EFOSA, they're the individual building blocks, and you have to learn them first. And we teach them, obviously, to our students. Now, after that EFOSA, now you need to learn how to put the pieces together. See, as architects, we don't, we don't touch the tech, we design it. So for us, it's not about how to configure it like they would teach in the Certified Solution Architect Professional. It's how to put the pieces together to maximize system availability, improve business performance. So now you're going to need some serious education from somebody. We could do it. Global Knowledge will charge about $10,000, and they'll give you some moderately effective architecture training. It's not to the depth that we do, but you still need to understand how to put the pieces and parts together.
It's kind of like a chef, for example. You know, they might need to know what chicken is and the carrot is and olive oil and garlic, but they need to be taught how to put the pieces together into a beautiful menu. Now, so far at FOSA, we've only covered the tech. Now, this is not a, this is only 40 to 50% tech, the rest of it's business. You will also need training in sales because we design, present, and sell the solution. And we've got to go sell the solution to our customer. So you're going to need to get sales training. I had about $10,000 of sales training to go from engineering to architecture after my MBA, of course. Next, you're gonna need some business acumen of FOSA. So either take our training or get an MBA program. It doesn't really matter, but you're gonna need that business acumen. You're gonna to have to be able to create an ROI model, for example, help the organizations examine their opportunity cost, position the technology as a matter to help them. When you're done that, you have to understand a FOSA that we have to lead people. And it's not like when you're in a PM role and somebody put on a project team, but they, we gotta build the team ourselves and sell the people into working for us. So now we're gonna to need to lead them. Now, LaFosa is architects, we present at conferences, and in order to get hired, you're gonna to have to present to a panel. So you're gonna to have to learn that as well. So make sure you get some training for that. Of course, all this training is in our Cloud Architect Career Development Program. Now, next, you're gonna need something called executive presence, because when you try to tell a customer that they need to spend a billion dollars on technology, if you don't have the executive presence, they're not gonna take you seriously. So again, I have about $20,000 of executive training, executive presence training, which I used to be an architect after, after my MBA. So make sure you have that kind of business acumen and you get that executive presence training, or just take our training and you're gonna get it. And those are realistically the things that you need to learn. That's a list by list by list. You can take our training, which we make it real easy. We have three live sessions per week. We've got hundreds of hours of other things that students do in between their own. But AFOSA, there's a reason these jobs um, pay so well, because it's not the kind of thing that you can li literally just do on your own. I mean, I was a principal architect in less than two years. There's a principal architect salary, 372 on average, with a range of 291 to 491. And uh, for example, another one, Here's another principal architect salary of 508, which is an average salary at Google. And the average salary is $203,000. So keep that in the back of your mind. This is not something that you're gonna be able to do on your own, unless you already have a lot of business acumen, a lot of leadership skills, and you've already been in tech. Now, you can get hired without experience. We've got people like Delroy Bad who had zero certifications, got hired with no experience. You could be like Vladimir, 24-year-old, who we got hired with no experience. Daniel, who we got hired with no experience, and he didn't even graduate high school. But we spent a lot of time training this kid, and he worked hard. You could be like Danny, who got hired just the other day as a cloud solutions architect as his first tech job. You could be like Balwinder, who was a stay-at-home mom, for example. You could be like Noah, whose previous job was a social worker who just got hired. And any of these things, we can easily get you hired, but you're going to need that kind of training. So at least I gave you a list and an honest list of everything that you need to know. But if you're struggling with the terminology in our videos, you're going to have to get training to get this kind of career. James, I love this question. Yeah. How much percentage of code kills? James, we don't code as architects. No. There's zero coding. No. In fact, James, if you wanted to be an architect, you would not even be allowed to touch your customer's technology. That means no management console means known infrastructure as code. It means no Linux. So James, there's a difference between design and building. I want you to take back. We architects come from the world of building architects. If I wanted a 30 story hotel design, I'd call an architect. And I would tell the architect I'd like three pools. I would like a golf course. It needs to be in South Florida, for example, where I live. So it needs to stand up to high winds and hurricanes and the architects would design it. And James, we assume everybody starts at the beginning level because the reality is whether you have a tech background or not, unless you've been an architect before, engineering and architecture are so different, they're not related at all. We don't code, we don't configure, we don't touch the technology, we design it, we present it and sell it. So James, I like to give you this difference between an engineer and an architect. A cloud network engineer will put a route on a virtual router in Japan. And they can see it instantly by looking at the rounding table. Architect doesn't touch the tech. The architect is, it thinks about, okay, when that person puts that route on the router in Japan, does it affect the voice systems in New York, the supply chain in Hong Kong, 
And does it affect, for example, the sales systems that are based in Tyson's Corner, Virginia? At the same time, that when that cloud engineer configures a firewall, the architect needs to think about how that affects the workers in New York City, for example. So architecture is about how do we design, keyword design, technology systems to improve business performance. And engineering is about how do I build them. Now, so many people have tried to become architects by becoming engineers, software engineers, cloud engineers, but guess what? that does not teach architecture. It's not a bad thing. It's a great thing when we have people coming from this background. We love it because they know more about a tech, but the reality is it doesn't teach them design because it's a different career. So no coding, no hands-on whatsoever. Now, James, here's the difference. In engineering, you learn how to, how do I configure this? How do I code this? In architecture, it's what happens. What are the implications? So James, if I throw a rock in a river and it's a giant rock, all of a sudden you see a splash and you, the, the, you've got little waves that reverberate around that watch. That's what architecture is. How does the tech that I design improve the worker's performance or does it hurt the worker's performance? How does the tech help that business make more money? How does that tech make the employees do a better job? That's architecture, James. That's it, James. And we get people hired every day and we'd love to work with you, but no coding skills whatsoever. In fact, you can look at some of the people who've gotten hired. You will not be allowed to touch the technology in your customer's network as an architect. Design, present, and sell. That is our job. Angel Gomez, I have an AWS uh, certified cloud practitioner and looking at three weeks to test out for the AWS Solutions Architect Associate. Currently in the DevOps engineering program, would love to know how I can be more competitive with no more with no more with no work experience in DevOps. Okay, Angel, I, I see that there's some um, some conflicts. Uh, reason being because you're focusing on the certified solution uh, practitioner. You're trying to clear the solutions architect associate, but you seem to currently be in DevOps and you want to focus on DevOps. So we need to figure out what you want to do first because well, please, Dev, please go ahead. Actually, and I didn't mean to cut you off, Alonzo. We actually don't know what job he wants. Yeah. He says actually. he's taking DevOps engineering and he wants to be more competitive. So Angel, Alonzo, and I need to know what career you want. Yes. If you Do you want to do DevOps? Do you want to do architecture? Um, you haven't told us. So Alonzo and I, and that's why we're that's why and Alonzo we're looking at and I was looking at it because we, we don't know what you want to do. Yeah, those you are gotta totally tell me different. what you'd want, which job yeah. you'd be interested in. Yeah. And then those we can totally kind of help you ones. get there. So if you could ask the uh apply that at you know, give us that answer, uh, Angel, that would be great because. You can't be in DevOps and become a cloud architect at the same time. Uh, but what I can, um, yeah, I, until we figure that out, I don't want to go down one path based on any, based on my assumption. And that's one of the uh, things as a cloud architect that we do not do. We don't go on any assumptions. We drill down into the question with more questions so that we can hone in and better uh, answer uh, answer your questions and provide solutions. Uh, this is from James. James, and thanks again. I just spoke with you, James, um, via uh, WhatsApp to try to invite you in. I'm glad you were able to make it. Tyrone, how long does the program take and how many hours do I need to successfully complete it? Um, James, when it comes to the program, um, it, it, we don't know what your daily day-to-day -day life commitments are, but usually from start to finish and getting cloud hired, it takes about eight to 12 months. To complete the program, we want to make sure that uh, no matter where you are in prior uh, career, whether it's tech related or not, that we start everyone from ground zero. And that way we're, we can eliminate any gaps and thereby create a gap analysis about where you are, how you can become a cloud architect on both the technical and business side. So overall, it doesn't uh, uh, it, it, we just want you to be committed, but usually the time frame is eight to 12 months from uh, the day you start to the day we can um, get you hired. So uh, to complete that, you know, we want you to be committed. That's a day that if it's 15 minutes a day, 
great. If it's an hour and a half, two hours a day, even better. However, we want you to stay committed. So through consistency and discipline, you'll be able to make those inches into feet, feet into uh, the overall completion of the program to be successful. And James, the key is you're going to be in our program until the day you're hired. Yes. You have a year in the live classes. The reason we sound somewhat noncommittal is, look, it takes on average eight to 12 months, but I don't know how fast you learn. For example, my wife learned Spanish in 10 days because her translators couldn't understand her thoughts. But my wife has 170 IQ. She can do calculus in her head. And if I give her a thousand page book, two hours later, she can remember the words on every single page. I can't do that. I wish I could, but I can't do that. And we have some people that learn super fast and some people that learn super slow. But that average eight to 12 months is pretty accurate. So all we care is that you do get hired. And we're not like one of those horrible boot camps out there that just take your money and the end of 16 weeks, you're on your own and yeah, ho hope you can get there. You're with us until you are hired. That's our commitment to you. If you don't give up on us, we don't give up on you. We want to know that you're hired and we are serious about getting our people hired and you can see you you can read about us in any magazine everywhere from forbes to devops magazine to information week to tech republic and tech radar we're out there because of the results we got and that's why we're the number one uh, ranked school of cloud computing by stellar business the world's last year okay from freedom lands is there such a thing as an independent cloud architect I don't like being locked into a location. I prefer to travel and do the work and make the money. Well, Freedom Lands, if you're an architect, you're going to travel. Now, could you be an independent architect? You could, but I strongly wouldn't recommend it. So people want to do this because they've been engineers, and as engineers, their employers treat them like garbage, and employers pay them very little. And they're trying to go on their own to make more money. You will make more money by working for an employer than you will on your own. I know architects that earn $800,000 a year or more working for big employers. Now, here's the thing, Freedom Lens. I could go on my own as an independent cloud architect. And here's the reason why. After 25 years of being an architect, I know chief information officers, chief executive officers, chief financial officers at every big company known to man. And I can pick up my phone and say, hey, do you need someone, big bank, X, Y, Z, to design your new whatever? And I could find business after 25 years. But Freedom Lands, I'm going to ask you this before you want to be an architect. First, you have between 20 and $50 million, because that's what it's going to cost you to do so. And here's the reason why. In every architecture, for real, it takes a team of 10 to 50 people to actually design it. So what you would need to do if you really wanted to go on your own is you would need to hire at least 20 architects at an average fully loaded salary of $250,000 a year. Minimum. And here's the reason why. It's going to take that many to design something. So that's $5 million you'd need right there. Now, Freedom Lands, architects don't touch the technology. We just design it. So you'd need a team of cloud engineers, too, to implement the stuff that we cloud architects design. So poof, now you need another 20 cloud engineers, $200,000 a year, including benefits. That's another 4 million. Now you're up to 9 million. Now, Freedom Lands, how are you going to convince a company to actually ask you to do their work? Well, now you're going to need a marketing budget of several million dollars. Let's say 5 million to actually kick that business off. So now you're at $14 million just to start. Am I going to hire somebody that I don't know and ask them to design my business for a billion dollars worth of tech? No way on earth. So when it comes to architects, we're going to hire somebody that works for Cisco, Microsoft, IBM, Deloitte, Accenture, Capgemini, and, and that's who we're going to hire. Or as a company, we're going to hire our own. So, you know, you don't hire a CEO part-time. You don't hire a director of sales part-time. You don't really hire an architect like that. This is not engineering. So the key is, could you do it? Sure. But you better have a lot of money to go out there and really build the team ahead of time. Because architects don't touch the tech. So first, you're going to need a team of architects. Maybe a couple of generic cloud architects, some cloud network architects, some cloud IAM architects, some cloud security architects, some cloud big data architects, some cloud develop application architects, just to design it. Because everything is a team. 
Then you're going to need a team of, team of the DevOps engineers, cloud engineers, software engineers to actually go build this stuff. And then you're done. Are you going to support the clients? And if so, do you have a tech support team? Did you build a network operations center for monitoring of your clients' things? That's what it really takes for us. So now you're not really going to be an independent cloud architect. And if you've got years of experience like me, sure, you can do it. But you better have a lot of C-level experience to get those clients. So I wouldn't recommend it. But architects aren't locked in any location anywhere. We're not engineers. I mean, I, when I lived in Palm Beach, Florida, I here's what my week was like. I'd fly to California on Monday. I'd go to England typically on Tuesday. I'd maybe be on Dubai on Wednesday. Maybe go to Australia on Thursday, Friday. And then the next two weeks, I'd be home in Palm Beach. The week after that, I'd be in Hong Kong for the week. The week after that, I'd be in continental Europe for the week. So it's not like we're going to have a boring job where we sit in the office all day doing the same humdrum thing every day. Not for us, but the point is, is this is not really a place. These are big executive positions, and companies don't hire executives as contractors as a rule. So do they exist? Yes, but would I recommend it? No. Uh, from James, James, is there any prerequisite to joining the program? No, no, no technical knowledge is necessary, no prior certifications, um, no uh, tech experience, nothing. And quite honestly, it's probably um, going to be advantageous for you to have that clean slate so that you're not going to be um, have any preconceived notions or expectations about tech. So we're able to start you from the ground up, James. So don't worry about that. There's no requirement. The only thing that we ask is that you work hard and that you bring in a serious uh, thirst for knowledge and um, desire to complete the program. Other than that, you have no prerequisites, and we're going to be happy to have you at any time you desire to join us. From Islam, it is better to know about how, about how things are built to make good design? No. No. So, Islam, I got to answer this. Let's say you wanted to design a hotel, and I handed you a hammer and nail and a screwdriver, and I taught you how to do construction. Do you think that would teach you how to design a building? No. Do you think anybody hires an airplane mechanic to fly an airplane? No. Because engineers who build learn the stuff that's in front of them, not what are the business implications of that. So no, it honestly has nothing. And we find people, Islam, that try to stay hands-on. They get fired real fast. And here's the reason they get fired real fast. The goal of the architect is to improve the customer's business performance, not build stuff. So the more you're focused on how to build, the less you're focused on how to help your, make your customers successful. If architects, generally speaking, don't get laid off. I have seen a lot of architects fired from not doing architecture, trying to do engineering, because they're the worst people on the team. Hmm. So the key is, here, I'll, I'll, I'll put it in a context that maybe feel more, more technical. Pretend I become a network engineer today, and I go to a router and type router BGP 65312. This is engineering. Neighbor, 192.168, remote AS 65313. Network, 10.0.0, mask 255.255.255.0. Now I just configured a BGP peering relationship. That's hands-on. Now, Islam. After the engineer does that, and many of the people that learn how to build just know how to do that, let's say this was an internet service provider. I take in 800,000 800, routes from that internet service provider. Now let's say I have BGP peering configured with eight different service providers. That thing, which somebody just typed on the router, can result in my traffic going out one internet service provider coming in back. If I take in the wrong routes, it can make sure that no traffic gets anywhere. It could affect the workers in England, even though I did this in South Africa. So no, learning how to design things has not, or how to build things has nothing to do with design. And that's where people err. They take these courses, they learn by doing, and nobody is interested in them because I ask them how to do something. So. Islam, I'll give you something. Uh, I'll give you something different. Alonzo is going to ask me a question. Now watch the difference. Alonzo, ask me how to configure a BGP peering relationship. Mike, how would you configure a BGP working relationship? Well, Alonzo, I would go to the Cisco router and I would type config t router BGP six five three one two neighbor one nine two one six eight remote as six five three one three. 
And I said it that way because that's a techie, and that's the way the banners made them. Now, it now now Islam Alonzo is going to ask me a design question, which is completely unrelated to anything that I would have learned about how to configure this. Now ask me how I could load share across two equal cost direct connect connections without getting out of order packets. How would you load share without getting out of order packets, Mike? Well, Alonzo, we've got a lot of architectural choices, and the one that we choose is going to be based upon the functionality and capabilities of your team. The first thing we could do, Alonzo, is we could put one specific subnet on one link and one specific subnet on the other link with an aggregate or summary routes on both links. And since routers prefer the most specific path, we can make sure that we load share that way. The alternative is we could change the weight on one subnet on one link to prioritize that and lower the weight on the same link to deprioritize that subnet. And on the other link, we could take the load, the, the link that we want to be used and change that weight and reduce the weight of the non-preferred -pre link. Alternatively, Alonzo, we could also change the local preference. We could take, say, the 172.16.0.0 slash 16 and raise that local preference to 200 from 100. And we could take the 172.17.0.0 slash 16 and reduce that local preference to 100 or keep it there. By comparison, on the opposite link, we can put the 172.17.0.0 slash 16 with a local preference of 200 because we want to bump it up to make it per. And we could change the local preference of the 172.16.0.0 slash 16 to a local preference of 100. But you know what, Alonzo? We could also prepend AS paths. For example, we could take the 172.16 on the top link that we have here mm -hmm. and keep the AS path 65313. But we can make the 172.17.0.0 slash 16 look ugly by adding or prepending an AS path go 65313, 65313. In Islam, I could answer how to do this all day. That's the difference. Engineering is about the commands and architecture is the how and the why and why we're doing things. So it's completely different. And no, the reality is, is there's no benefit from learning how to configure for the architect because mm -hmm. it does not teach you design. But then again, if I handed you a hammer and a nail driver and a, and a screwdriver, do you think anybody would hire you to design a thousand story tall skyscraper? Of course they wouldn't because they hire architects to design and construction crews to build. Totally different set of skills. From Malcolm Spites, if we already have the Cloud Practitioner Solution Architect Cert, how do we get over the hump of needing experience to land a job in the field without having the experience they want for uh, becoming a solutions architect? Well, Malcolm Spites, first, you, if you are actually an architect and you actually know architecture, mm -hmm. it would be nothing. But... I'm going to tell you right now, nobody's going to hire you with those certifications because nobody cares. And here's the reason. Malcolm, if I asked you, how would you design an IP addressing scheme for an organization with 20,000 remote locations? How would you answer that? And here's why. It's not covered in the Solutions Architect Professional, no. and it's not covered in the AWS Advanced Networking, but an architect needs to do that. Now, Malcolm, Malcolm if I asked you to build a business case, and I asked you to convince a customer that spending a billion dollars on technology was well worth it, how would you create that ROI model? How would you show that customer that the billion dollars spent on your solution is better than a billion dollars spent somewhere else? Promise you it's not covered in the solution architect professional. No. no. If I asked you, how would you architect a situation that needs high speed and high intelligence across different servers, how would you architect that? I promise you that's not covered in the AWS Advanced Networking either. If I told you, Malcolm, we've got something that needs low latency disks performance, how would you do that in the cloud? Again, that's not covered. And the reason why is cloud storage or block storage is slow despite what's in there. So Malcolm Heights, first you need to be an architect and you need to be trained as an architect. Then you need to go out there and build your brand. Our students don't apply for jobs. One of my students, Doug, is here. People reach out to him every single day to hire him because he's got a brand. So if you went out there and you talked about how to design solutions and how they can improve business performance, you'd be there and the world would come to you. If you understood architecture, you would know what to put on your resume to have employers come to you. But I'm going to tell you right now, nobody cares about you having any AWS certification whatsoever. And nobody cares if you have experience. Yvonne Tamba had no experience before AWS hired him. 
Coyote had no experience before AWS hired him. Jeffrey West had no experience before AWS hired him. Vladimir had no experience before he got hired. Delray had no experience before he got hired. Bowender had no experience before he got hired. Jeffrey had no experience before he got hired. Uh, Daniel had no experience before he hired. Wallace Agana, who was on this YouTube video, had no experience before he got hired. Jennifer Emu had no experience before he got hired. But they cook an architecture training program. Companies come to us every single day and they ask us, who can I hire from your students? But you're going to need to know how to become an architect. Yeah. Come on the Thursday webinar and you can actually learn to become an architect. And Malcolm, while you're at it, I'll even interview you if you want and see if you know anything about architecture. And if not, I'll even tell you what you need to learn. And I'll do it completely free on our webinar live. You can come on the camera and do it. But um, I can tell you, I've interviewed a thousand AWS certified people. Most of them had the certified solution architect professional. Not a single one knew architecture. Nobody cares if you have experience. They care if you are competent. Mm. Competent is the ability to do the job and do it well. Experience is how long you've done something. When it comes down to it, nobody cares about your experience. HR doesn't a job description, but Malcolm, I'm hoping you're not applying for jobs. I'm hoping you're building your brand and you're doing things to make the world come to you. I'm hoping so anyway, because if you're not, and you apply for jobs, you're going to get auto-rejected. Yeah. What are you doing brand building wise? What are you doing to show the world that you're capable? What architectures have you designed to show the world that you can do things? What business problems do you know how to solve? Where are you speaking? Where are you blogging? What are you writing? Those are the things. Come to the webinar on Thursday and we'll tell you exactly how. And from someone from a personal perspective, uh, Malcolm, I do have the certified uh, solutions architect associate and I did do the practitioner and it was to naught, unfortunately, because it only gives you that AWS perspective, not the overall agnostic approach um, that many companies of which 98% are doing multi-cloud implementations. So just please, you know, as Mike um, uh, elaborated, please join us. We'd love to have you. And um, so that you'll be able to gauge and be able to provide, we we'll you know, be able to provide you with more resources if you're not, you know, if your desire is not to work with us. But overall, I, I definitely firmly believe that a lot of your answers and a lot of what we provide um, from a free resource perspective is not being answered anywhere else but at Go Cloud Career. So please join us. We want you to be um, uh, successful whether you're with us or not. And this is from Purnell. What's the job market like for an infrastructure uh, architect? Because I am in, I, I see an overwhelming amount of general cloud architects jobs in comparison. You know, Purnell, here's the thing. When it comes to specialty architect positions like an infrastructure architect, for someone like me who spent a decade working at Cisco as a lead infrastructure architect and a lead enterprise architect, market's great. But I want you to truly understand the architect's job. The architect's job is how do I improve a business's performance with technology? I'm going to say this again. How do I improve a customer's business performance with technology? So the closer you get to the technology, the less jobs and the lower your salary will be. The further, the closer you get to improving the customer's business performance, the higher the salary will be. So if you're a good networking person, Purnell, sure, there's plenty of jobs for infrastructure architects like me. If you're not a good networking person, forget it. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, when it comes to infrastructure architects, we're talking deep, deep, deep knowledge. We're not talking this basic nonsense like the AWS advanced networking, which should be called the intro to junior, 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 junior level networking. We're talking deep knowledge. And I don't equate certifications with competency with the exception, one, exception of one. I would say my intro to networking or infrastructure knowledge was the Cisco certified internet expert. And I only had to spend $40,000 and read 75,000 pages to do that exam. And I'm not joking. That's what I invested in it to do it in those days. That was the beginning of my infrastructure knowledge. Since then, it took me 25 years to actually learn infrastructure. Is the, is the job market for an infrastructure architect good? Yes. But 
it's going to be better for the generic architect that's got good business skills because who do I really want as a CEO? Who am I going to pay more? Someone who can make my tech work or someone who can really make my business better? Lots of companies do $20 billion in revenue. It's pretty normal for any kind of big Fortune 500 company. If a good architect can improve their revenue by 1%, they made their business 20, 20, mil, or $20 million more profitable. They can't ask for any salary they want. I can make your network work. Great. Guess what? There's a lot of people that can make your network work. Mm. So, yeah, you're going to see a lot more jobs as generic because... Generic architects work in teams. And uh, so I would say, depends what your goal is. If you want to be a techie, the infrastructure architect is a great job. It's going to be the closest you get to stay techie and still be an architect. Because we architects aren't techie. You know, as an architect, it was which Armani suits or Canali suits could I buy? And believe me, it mattered. As an architect, Purnell, I had more discussions with, I had to learn how to play golf. I had to take golf lessons. I had to learn which wine to pick and which wine to go and wine pairing with food. I even had to get to get training on which fork to use and how to order yeah. scotch. I mean, that's architect stuff. So you got to really, really start looking at these things, um, for example, and kind of keep those in the back of your head, if you mind. So much more jobs for generic. Okay. From Angel, I got the cert certificates to get more exposure to at least one cloud computing service in terms of type of DevOps career. I would love to and would be would be in, I would like to be involved in the gaming industry. But anything would be great just to start gaining experience, just having trouble even getting reached uh, back over applying to multiple jobs. Uh, Mike, you can tackle this or I can do it. It's up to you. So, Angel, my hope is that you're not in the U.S., and the reason I'm saying this is about a year ago, we stopped selling engineering programs and we begged people to get out of engineering in the US. So hopefully you're in another country because you know things changed a few years ago. First, and we put out a lot of warnings if you've ever seen things. First, you know, work from home. So Angel, it used to be that we needed our engineers to come to the office. Now with COVID, we're in a work from home world. Right. So. Angel, I wouldn't expect most employers to hire a DevOps engineer in the U.S. Why would they? For example, the average property in California is $1.49 million for like a two-bedroom bungalow, which means i got to pay somebody $400,000 a year to break even. In India, I can pay somebody $28,000 a year, and they're very well off, and I can get myself a great DevOps engineer. So as a rule, don't expect to get hired in the U.S. for some of these engineering positions unless you have some special skills, which we'll talk about. And, Angel, that's why we closed, we stopped selling our, our engineering programs about a year ago. First, we saw what was going on in the economy. We knew most of these IT, these engineering jobs would be, art, would be outsourced while architect jobs would be hired. So I don't know where you live, but I'm going to tell you right now it's going to be a lot harder to get an engineering job in the U.S. Architect jobs, I can get you one all day if you were properly trained. Engineering jobs are there. Two, ChatGPT can do most of the DevOps engineers' jobs. And ChatGPT is just the beginning. That's why Microsoft laid off 10,000 employees and uh, at the same time um, invested $10 billion. AWS has their code whisper. Google has their barb. Garb, you can write all your, tar your, your DevOps scripts with, with, with ChatGPT and others. So again, I don't need to hire an employee for this. So the key is, Angel, I hope you've got some other skills. You know, what can't be replaced, Angel? Leadership skills. What can't be replaced? Sales skills. What can't be replaced? Executive presence. What can't be re replaced is the ability to communicate and build a team. And that's why we stopped selling engineering courses in the U.S. We may come back with the Engineer of the Future program, but it's going to look very different than what's being taught today. So I'm hoping you don't live in the U.S. because in the U.S. I think you're going to have a really hard time getting an engineering job any, in the next year or so because companies are still going to be laying off engineers for a while before they hire them. They're hiring architects like crazy, and here's the reason why. As new technologies come in, we need more architects. Plus, the architects are customer-facing, and AI can't do this, and architects are revenue-generating positions. But if you've got your heart set on DevOps, 
and you're outside the U.S., hopefully, what I would ask you to is first make sure that what you're training is nothing related to the certifications. Nobody cares about your certifications. Nobody cares about your GPA in college. Nobody cares about your try hack me percent or any of that nonsense. No one cares. They care, can you do the job? So Angel, for DevOps, not architecture, for DevOps, how good of a software engineer are you? Because DevOps is the merging of engineering. How good are your skills with the non-cloud stuff? The Jenkins, the Spinnakers, how good are your cloud DevOps skills? How good are your Git skills for DevOps engineers? How good are your Terraform skills? Your automation skills, for example? All over, so I would ask you those things. Now, Angel, if you're gonna hire somebody in the US that's an engineer, you better prove some reason why you can do a better job than those outside the US. What do you have out there showing your motivation, energy, enthusiasm, and passion for the work, for example? What can you do to show people that you can take direction and you've got some oomph behind you as opposed to just coming in and complaining? Because employer, U.S. employee productivity right now is the lowest level it's been in decades, and that's why employers are either saying outsource overseas or come back to the office. What kind of articles have you written out there, Angel? Have you written any articles that show some aspect of DevOps and how it's going to improve businesses' performance somehow to show you as a leader? Are you, and, and when it comes to blogging and writing, there's two kinds. There's the, I learned how to do something. If you put that out there, you're showing employers not to hire you. Or I, create, I installed uh, a web server on Linux. Guess what? I can install a web server on Linux too sudo app install httpd. Don't make a 50 page document on that because that's going to show that you don't know how to communicate. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. So there is that. Now, if it's DevOps engineering, Sandy Daz has a very good YouTube channel to actually help you do things as well that I would highly recommend. I don't recommend DevOps engineering careers. I don't. I don't recommend engineering careers in general for people in the United States for about a year now. But Architect jobs, I do recommend. But if you're out there and you're not getting people reaching out to you, what are you doing to show depth? What's your LinkedIn profile like? How often do you post on LinkedIn? Are you showing yourself as a leader on LinkedIn? Or are you showing yourself as a techie on LinkedIn? What are you doing to show the world to come to you? But if you're, try if you're in the U.S. and you're applying for engineering jobs, architects are getting hired every day, but engineering positions are going to be much harder to get in the U.S., and here's why. Companies still have a lot more surplus people to get rid of still in the engineering space. And uh, what happens, Angel, is, and I've been consulting to companies forever. A company can have 20,000 tech people. There may only be 500 people that are actually working. And the other ones are playing ping pong and foosball. And they're breaking things. And then the 500 have to go fix it. So the, I expect... More architect hires. I had another person get reached out to me today because they just got hired, one of my students. But I expect more engineering layoffs. So please protect yourself if you're an engineer. Yeah. And this from Dark Side. In India, could engineers, in India, cloud engineers are paid less. How to get a job outside of India? Well, they're not really paid less, Dark Side. So let's explain what I mean by that. In the US, $100,000 is equivalent to $28,000 in the US. It doesn't, so in economics, we have the term nominal dollars and we have real dollars. So if you're in Cameroon, you can buy a house for $24,000 on average. If you're in San Francisco, it's gonna cost you $1.49 million to get the same house as $24,000 in Cameroon. You need to earn a lot more in San Francisco. In, the New, in, in New York, people are poor at $200,000 a year. In India, people are rich at $50,000 a year. So you have to adjust things for the cost of living. And after you adjust for the cost of living, the key is, are they really paid less? Now, I'm also going to give you the secret to earning more in the U.S., in the U.K., or Europe. The engineers who are techie, 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 are the lowest paid of the bunch. Want to know the difference dark side between a $300,000 engineer in the US 
and an $80,000 engineer in the US? I'm gonna tell you right now. Soft skills, executive presence, emotional intelligence skills, leadership skills, and business acumen. In India, by comparison, the schools and the educational system are probably the best engineering programs in the world. India produces some extraordinarily good engineers. So good that in the US, we used to have to sponsor H-1B visas to bring them in pre-COVID and pre-everybody working from home. But in India, they typically in schools don't typically talk about soft skills, executive presence, business acumen, emotional intelligence, and leadership. Now, dark side, if you actually were to Google and go to salary.com, the average salary of someone with business acumen skills in the US, you'd see it's $553,000 per year. Why do you think we do so much business acumen training to our architects? Next, emotional intelligence. The statistics are staggering. In the US and the UK and Europe, the best predictor of long-term career success is someone's emotional intelligence. In the US, individuals with higher levels of emotional intelligence and average paying jobs earn $29.6,000 more per year than people with, uh, for example, um, at, with lower levels of emotional intelligence. And plus, for each 1% of emotional intelligence, there's an additional $1,300. $1, and that's on average paying jobs. You'll see people in tech with higher levels of emotional intelligence earn an extra $100,000 over their peers. Now, language dark side. The more precision your communication skills are, the more valuable you are, especially in continental Europe, in England, in Canada, in the US, and here's the reason why. Without good communication skills, errors occur. So dark side, the key, and the other thing that most people do to tank their careers, we see it a lot in India, but we also see it a lot in the US. People go and get 10 certifications. It's the worst thing you can do for your career. And here's why. I need somebody who can do the job and do it well. The worst thing somebody does is the 10X AWS certified person. Why do I say this is the biggest career mistake ever? None of the AWS certifications are enough for anything. So if I wanted to be an architect, for example, I'd have somebody do the solution architect associate, the solution architect professional, they get some badges on their resume. No, they wouldn't learn anything in there and then learn how to be an architect. But if I have an architect that trains DevOps, DevOps is another career that doesn't make them a better architect, but what it does is it shows me the architect's not focused. And if I've got somebody that mastered that's learning two careers, they can't be as good as if they spent all their focus on one career. And then they learn maintenance or sysops, which again, architects don't touch because we don't maintain. Then you got somebody that does a developer certification. Now they look even worse because as an architect, you want a business specialist, not a, not a software developer. Poof, now they got three careers. So the key is get deep in your career. Don't learn 10 other people's jobs. That will bump up your salary in India, but it will also get you jobs outside of India. And the world will fight to have somebody that's really good like that. And for the right people, that H-1B, um, to be able to work in different organizations for that right person, they will definitely uh, make that happen. So, yep. um, you know, we, you know, not to diminish engineers, but there are far more engineers than there are cloud architects. And so when you think about the economies of scale of what they're willing to pay, um, I mean, I think it's an interesting segue into uh, having this discussion about cloud architects uh, based on Glassdoor right now. They're making uh, 200000 200 and yeah, $200,820 per year um, in American dollars. And that's with zero or any experience versus a cloud engineer, which is making $152,300 per year. Um, as a cloud engineer. So you're looking at a $45,000 uh, increase over what cloud engineers make. So um, based on that and your ability to be competent, capable, and what they're looking for, an H-1B would be a drop in the bucket for what they want in, yeah. the, uh, in, the, in the right role and the right person in that role. For example, we had Nyan who was a student we trained. He was here on a university visa. He graduated the university. He also graduated our program. And he got, he got newly sponsored to be a cloud architect. No work experience whatsoever. First architect job. And they even sponsored a visa to keep him in the United States. But we gave him excellent training and he was fantastic. Rajan, what is the future of cloud and DevOps in terms of job market in India? 
I think there's good DevOps opportunities in India. I strongly do. Because India's got a great engineering education, great software education, and the US, the UK, and Canada do a lot of outsourcing to uh, India. But Rajan, I also think there's going to be a lot of outsourcing of these engineering jobs to Africa as well, where there's a very educated population who typically has very good language skills. But uh, for DevOps, I think it's great in India. From Angel, for any veterans watching this, can we use our GI, GI Bill to join your course? Angel, we worked really hard to develop the content that we did, and we put a con we course together that gets our students hired every single day of the week. Almost every day somebody gets hired. If we had to comply with U.S. government regulations, our course would be 10 times more expensive, and we probably would not have the success rate that we have right now because we would have to do specific things to fit into a curriculum, kind of like what they teach in college. We are really, really focused on getting people hired. And we do things that nobody else would do because we are experts in doing this. I've spent 20 years helping people get hired. But we do have a special program for veterans, Angel. And uh, if you send an email to info at gocloudcareers.net, and Tyrone can put that in the chat box, it is a very special opportunity for veterans. And uh, all you have to do is either show an active duty ID or a DD-214 if you're retired. And uh, it's something very, very special that we do for the veterans community. From Vernon. Hi, Mike and Elonzo. I have curiosity. Would it help to get cliff notes from those books you mentioned earlier to learn cloud architect skills? No, Vernon. You have to understand each and every intricate detail of these books to be able to design them. Cliff Notes is not enough for anything. So no, um, Cliff Notes is not gonna be. You need knowledge, yeah. not Cliff Notes. Cliff Notes is the how-to. I need you to understand all the depth. And understand, Vernon, when you think about using Cliff Notes to achieve a salary in a career that's more than $200,000, including uh, bonuses, commissions, access to a lot of great resources for increased training, clip notes, Udemy, um, those type of training, it, it's not going to be enough. You have to learn a lot of what they do not teach. And uh, it, it's just not sufficient enough. And t trust me, I've been down that path and it took me a whole a lot of wasted time and resources to get to that point where I was able to get the resources I need or go, go cloud careers to get me where I, where I need to be. So no ASMR, no reading um, and sleeping at the same time for maximum absorption. That that's just not applicable here. You know, from Rosella question. I am currently a cloud engineer for a fortune 500 Car company, I am looking to transition into the cloud architects. Any tips? Yes, you're going to need training. So there's two ways you can do this. And Rosella, I've got a course full of cloud engineers and I have to retrain them. I'm also going to tell you this, Rosella. It is no easier for me to train a cloud engineer to become an architect than it is somebody with no experience. Because the cloud engineer is all about the how-to. And we're all about the why. So Rosella, the reason I created our cloud architect career development program is I didn't want people to do what I did. I was an engineer. Here's how I transitioned from engineering to architecture. Remember, Rosella, the goal of the engineer is to build it, to performance tune it, and to make it work. The goal of the architect is to drive business transformation or digital transformation. How do I make that business more profitable with technology? How do I change the customer's journey? How do I change the employee's journey? How do I make my employees more productive? How do I increase the organization's revenue? How do I cut the organization's cost? That's architecture. So what I did was as follows. I was a working engineer, and then I got an MBA, and then I got about $100,000 of additional training in CXO relevancy, sales training, executive presence, communication skills, leadership skills, and business acumen after my MBA. So my recommendation for you is one of the two things. Either take our course, and we've got everything you needed in that course. For, and our average tuition is three days pay. Or if you're not with us, get an MBA. 
and then take and then learn architecture skills. So instead of learning how to configure something, learn how something works. That's the big difference. For example, I had a couple of conversations with software developers. And I wanted to, and they were like, does my being a software engineer help me being a cloud architect? And I said, let's see how much you know about compute. And I asked them processor architecture and they didn't understand. I asked them DRAM architecture I didn't understand, they didn't understand. I asked them PCIe architecture they didn't understand. I asked them about storage area networks and they didn't understand. I asked them about networking and they didn't understand. And I said, well, it's not gonna help you at all because architects don't really code. Now that doesn't mean I don't love software engineers, I do. And it doesn't mean that having knowledge of how applications are made isn't helpful in some way, shape or form, but it's a different job. So Rosella, a doctor builds the treatment plan for the patient and the nurse executes the plan. The architect really does the same job as the doctor. Ask the client what they want and formulate a treatment plan. The cloud engineer does the same job for, as a nurse would do. And guess what happens when nurses want to be doctors? They have to go to medical school. So you're going to have to get training in order to do that. That's my recommendation. That's my tips. Because if you try to do it on your own, you're not going to be successful unless you go, get all this business acumen, leadership, sales, and communication. Yeah. Rosella, I speak with hiring managers every day, chief executive officers, chief information officers, VP of HR, and they say, Mike, I don't want an engineer. I want an architect. And I like to, I usually like to ask them, what do you mean by that? Because I always like to have people tell me so I don't make assumptions. They say, I don't want a techie. I want a business executive that understands how to apply technology to solve business problems. I want a leader. I want someone that can close a billion dollar deal. I want someone that can sell. I don't want a techie. So Rosella, you're gonna also have to do, you're gonna also, and after you learn those skills, then you're gonna need a rebranding. You're gonna have to have somebody like an Alonzo help you build your brand to show that the engineering you did was not who you are now. And that's a lot of the work we do with engineers is rebrand them from engineer to architect to show that they're a digital transformation specialist as opposed to a systems builder. It's a great question though. Uh, back to Islam, do I need to know about multiple cloud architectures such as AWS, Azure, and GCP or Google Cloud Platform, or do I have to focus on one of them, all of them? Because, and it, even more than that, it, we're focusing on the agnostic cloud. Those are, um, look at it like this, Islam, you, um, if you like ice cream, AWS is vanilla, Azure is strawberry, Google is chocolate. Um, you only know about how to make you only know how to make strawberry ice cream or vanilla or chocolate. Being a cloud architect, we know about ice cream, period. We can talk about any flavor of ice cream you want, 31 different flavors and more because there's more solutions in AWS, Azure, and Google. Say, for instance, you need a next generation of firewall. Let's talk about Fortinet, Checkpoint, Palo Alto, and Cisco. Let's look at how uh, they incorporate intrusion detection and intrusion prevention systems that help to uh, eliminate those packets through packet filtration, if I'm not mistaken, so that they are able to kill those bad actor executions uh, before they even get to the environment. So those things, and based on what I know as being a cloud architect, as well as uh, having an AWS practitioner, as well as AWS solutions architect uh, certifications, they do not have those in any of those questions. And ironically, with those exam questions, all of those solutions are AWS uh, oriented. So in reality, we don't live in a bubble. We don't live in AWS. That's not our world. That's not our full world. So understanding the architect, cloud architect um, uh, solutions, we focus on what's good for the client. That's what, not what's good for AWS, Azure, or Google Cloud Platform. So understanding that comprehensive knowledge and deep dive into that, coupled with execution of presentation skills, CXO relevancy, uh, business acumen, and, and so forth. This is the culmination of what a cloud architect does. So throw out whatever the industry has been saying about the value of these certifications, because it's not true. We're bucking the system. We're trying to get people hired. We're not trying to get people certified. So please take that to the bank and apply that towards your training. And one more thing, Islam. You have to understand between, differentiate between how the, how the stuff works versus how to configure it. If we're talking about BGP, for example, if it's a Cisco router, a Juniper router, 
a Palo Alto router, AWS virtual router, Azure virtual router, or Google virtual router, it's still the same VGP. Now, if you take the certification, you'll learn the funny, stupid marketing name that they make up for it, and then you'll learn how to configure it, which architects don't do. So you need to understand how the tech works. Same way you would drive a car. You don't get certified in three different cars. It's irrelevant. It's silly. You need to understand how it works. So if you're dealing with a virtual machine and you truly understand the way the server is and you understand the processor, CPU, and DRAM of the server, whether it has PCI pass-through or not or single root I.O. virtualization for the hard drive or a pass-through GPU, it doesn't matter if it's a VMware virtual machine, a Nutanix virtual machine, an OpenStack virtual machine, an AWS virtual machine called EC2, a Google virtual machine called Compute Engine Instance, or an Azure virtual machine or an Oracle virtual machine. It's the same thing. You need to know the underlying technology, how it works, not any of the stuff that's in the certification. Yeah. From Freedom Lands, are the cloud architect jobs available for the US citizens outside of their country? Uh, yeah, I, I believe so. Why wouldn't they be? Um, just making sure that you have the proper credentials. Um, I tell you, it's, it's an amazing thing, Freedom, is that with your competency and being able to be the right person for the job, you'd be amazed at what companies will be willing to do to ensure that you get locked in because they'd rather have you as a human capital asset instead of you working for a competitor. And they know the skills that are necessary to become a cloud architect. And those who are in the know based on our training, they're able to see through. Our training, it's ironic, it's like an x-ray machine to be able to see through uh, those role requirements that you see on a daily basis and in Indeed, um, LinkedIn, and so forth. And those are just, that's just a little bit, um, that's just a, a, a drop, you know, tip of the iceberg of what we're able to, to train our students to understand. So uh, to your point, why wouldn't it? I say yes, there, there's going to be availability for those expatriates um, who are American citizens that just lives outside the country. No problem. Absolutely. I spent lots of time in Dubai designing things, for yep. example, but here's the key, Freedom Lands. Architect jobs and the reason they can't be outsourced is as following. You have to interact with your client, which means you got to go meet them, which means you're going to have to travel to them. These jobs require a lot of soft skills, communication skills, emotional intelligence, executive presence, but it's about relationships. So, for example, when I work from my home in Greece, which I do periodically, I go visit clients in Europe. When I work from my home in Florida, I go visit clients in the U.S. or throughout the world. That's the key. As long as you can travel to your clients, you're good to go. But that's why, for the most part, architect jobs aren't remote jobs and are so hard to outsource to lower parts, cost parts of the world. It's that need for the face-to-face -face contact, the need to entertain your client, the need to take them for golf, the need to take them for good dinners and scotches, for example, to build that relationship. That's the key. So sure, they exist outside the U.S. Just like we have non-Americans getting jobs in the U.S. Americans get jobs in Europe all over the place, for example. Somebody wanted me to support a client in Japan from Florida. Of course, I was going to have to fly to Japan a lot. Not that I mind going to Japan. I love Japan, but that's neither here nor there. I just, I don't like the flight. Yeah, it's a long flight. <laughs> I've been on them twice. <laughs> it's a long one. From Alan Wright, how long is ex how long is it expected for your students to job search before landing uh, their first cloud job? Alan, I don't expect our students to job search at all. I expect them to be in our program and they get hammered by recruiters if they do the work in our program and they get hired inside of our program. It takes on average eight to 12 months from the time somebody joins our program and the time they're hired, if they come to class, if they do the work, yeah. for example. And then another great thing about it, Alan, is the one thing about our program is that you go through the program, we know we were able to gauge your competency and say, Alan is ready to go, he's ready to start getting hired. We start honing in on your resume. We start fortifying that according to what our needs are. Uh, rather, your needs are as becoming a cl competent cloud architect. We work on your uh, uh, your LinkedIn presence because that is a reflection of who you are as a competent cloud architect. And three, there's four things that we do here is that Mike has uh, amassed an incredible network of uh, hiring agencies, hiring professionals who are looking for competent and capable cloud architects. They're looking and asking for him 
uh, profusely, if you will, about who is ready to get hired. We got plenty of opportunities. Uh, option two, I'm always adding in um, uh, uh, roles that are needing to be filled on LinkedIn, Glassdoor, and so forth in our uh, Slack community. Option three, um, once you become a, uh, a, uh, a, a client of ours, um, over time, you're going to have the opportunity to be able to say that you are interning uh, with us and with the reputation that we've amassed on LinkedIn. That's kind of like the green light for hiring managers uh, to start uh, communicating with you about opportunities that they have. And option four, uh, if you see a job that you like, you really want to hone in and lean in on, uh, bring it to us. Bring it to uh, Mike, Chris, myself, any of our instructors to say, I want to go for this role. And then we start working with you to hone in and get ready for that role and to uh, make that resume a reflection of what they want best in a, in a, in a, in a uh, human capital asset. So uh, to your point, Alan, we are, we are geared, we are focused on getting you hired. And so we have plenty of options and resources to get that realized. And I did it just last weekend. A good friend of mine at one of the five best tech companies in the world said, I need someone that has this skill. I reached out to someone that I know and trust from our program. She tuned her resume, and uh, I sent her that email to this person just today. And I'm pretty sure she'll get a job there because this person is pretty special. Um, and I know that anybody would be lucky to have this person on their team. And from Silent Poet, at the point we think we are ready, should, ch should, change, should we change our LinkedIn, whichever architect you choose to be, and not aspiring cloud architect or something along those lines? I don't hire aspiring anybody and I don't hire junior anybody. If you're, or an enthusiast anybody, if you're an aspiring anybody, you're basically telling employers, you hope one day that you might learn enough to do that. So don't have that on there. Yeah, it, it doesn't look good on you. It's like saying that I, uh, you're getting on a plane, on a flight, and then you see the, uh, the uh, you're walking to the terminal and someone is saying, um, I'm flying your plane, but I hope to be a pilot one day. I don't, I don't think that's going to amass a lot of confidence about you getting to your destination. Same thing here. When you aspire to be something, that means that you're not. And uh, a, a company is going to honestly say, well, we'll aspire to hire you when you're ready. So exactly. it's that same type of energy that you're putting out there is that they're going to say they're not ready, don't hire them. And maybe it might be unfair, might not be. Um, but they may put your name on a roster about saying that this is not the people that we're looking for. So don't brand yourself as an aspirant. Brand yourself right. as a cloud architect. And this is uh, Islam again. Could you differentiate between cloud architect and cloud security architect? And what is the career plan for a cloud security architect? Cloud architect focuses on everything. The net, all, the, everything to improve the customer's business performance, whether they be their servers, their containers, their storage, their security, their applications, everything. Cloud security architect only focuses on the security, just the security. What, what, so for example, not how to configure the security, it's an engineer. So we're talking about what should the security policy look like for the organization? What are the security organization's training needs? What assets need to be protected? What should the demilitarized zones look like? What types of firewalls should be used? What types of intrusion detection, intrusion prevention should be used? What type of server hardening needs to occur? What type of encryption strategy? That's the kind of things for architecture. And here, same thing to be an architect. You're gonna to need to get the business acumen, the leadership skills, the sales skills, the executive presence communication skills, and then you're gonna to need to study security, not how to, but why. So if you want to know more about that, attend the How to Get Your First Cloud Job webinar, and we'll cover that, cover that on Thursday because it's going to take a long time to go into that. And uh, Shazad, why can't they outsource cloud architect positions? So Shazad, one year I was an architect, and I spent $100,000 on my corporate credit card buying lunches, entertaining my client, and $100,000 on dinners, drinks, and golfing, entertaining my client. I went to my client site every single day. My client knew me. I was there each day asking about their pain points. I was building, building and developing relationships. Can't do that if you're not there. It's the human side of the architect. 
The fact that you got to go talk to the CEO, the fact that you got to talk to the VPs, the fact that you got to go talk to the department heads, the fact that you got to walk through the company and actually ask the people in the business, how do you do your job? What challenges have you do your job? The fact that you got to go ask the organization's customers in person, hey, you're shopping at this store. What part of the experience was good? What part of the experience was bad? You can't do that if you're in another country. That's why you can't outsource these positions. And look at it from their perspective. You, you always, for you to, this is one of the things that I've learned is that for you to help solve a problem, you have to look at it from your, uh, the other persons on the other side of the table, look at it from their point of view. So if you're, you're asking me to spend multi-million dollar implementation over a course of years from someone that you've outsourced, that's like a hired gun, if you will. Yeah. So if there's no appearance of loyalty to an organization that you're working for, how am I going to feel about you having some loyalty to me, some loyalty to this project, some loyalty to this organization that is trusting you with their project, their implementation, uh, their change management implementation, and so forth. There's a lot that just goes into this instead of you just handing it off to someone else. There, there's so much that is happening downstream from, from the decision that they make from your implementation um, that is even more uh, money outside of the, the 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 cloud and data sources resource data you know data center resources than that. So that's some of the reason why you can't be a hired gun, if you will, um, if you want people to trust you in your your capability. From James T. Goal. My goal is to become a security architect. Between AWS and Azure, is there one? one more security focus over the other. I'm filling in the blanks here. So if you could elaborate a little bit more. I'll, I'll answer this. Okay. So James T, I think you're missing the point. If you want to be a security architect, you're not going to be using this cloud security stuff anyway. I will tell you that Microsoft is more security oriented than AWS. Microsoft is technically the number one security player in the world. Having said all that, you're not going to be using AWS WAF or a Microsoft firewall if you're a cloud security architect. If they're looking for a cloud security architect, they want next generation firewalls. So on all clouds, you're gonna be reaching out to Palo Alto, to Checkpoint, to Fortinet, for example. You're gonna be dealing, you're gonna be reaching out to other identity and access management vendors. This cloud native security stuff is kind of like the Swiss army knife. <laughs> we got little things and nobody does anything well versus like the Marines that are given a Kabar knife. And it's this big, long knife that's really great. If they needed to chop a tree down, they can chop a tree down with the knife. If they needed to start a fire, they can start a fire with the knife because it's a big, strong knife. All clouds are the same. It's just you're renting space in somebody else's network in a data center. If you're concerned about security, you're going to learn security. You're going to be talking to Palo Alto. And for example, I've got lots of friends that are cloud security architects, and I've gotten a lot of them hired. Every day, they're calling the other security vendors to figure out what they can do. And that's half of the job of the cloud security architect, vendor management. Hmm, I need two layers of next generation firewalls. Palo Alto has got the most adaptive one right now. It's probably the best for these reasons. But you know what? Checkpoint does this really good thing really well. And even though they both have intrusion detection, intrusion prevention, if I use another IDS IPS system from another vendor, I can get those security logs. You know what needs to happen on those virtual machines. It's the same Linux, whether it's Red Hat on AWS or Azure or Google. I'm using Red Hat, but you know I got to remove these unnecessary packages. It's the same thing. So a cloud is kind of like which supermarket do you buy your eggs from? Does it matter if it's Aldi, Publix, Acme, Shop and Stop, or whoever else uh, supermarkets are out there? It doesn't matter. Most of the security stuff is not from the cloud provider. You need to know the security stuff, James. Mm -hmm. Yeah. From RH, your architect description sounds a lot like executive facing positions like IT director or CIO. What are the distinctions? <laughs> RH, these um, are executive positions. Yeah. Most architects are director level people. Some are VP level people if they're principal architects. As a CIO, you're architecting the organization's technology strategy. Guess what you're doing as a cloud architect? You're, organ, organ, you're looking at the organization's technology strategy. They're very similar, which is why you find so many architects like me moving into C-level roles, because they're very similar. The CIO is 100% business. 
the, the, the enterprise architect job is 80% business. The cloud architect job is 60 to 70% business, but it's very, very, very similar. The architect role takes more knowledge than the, than the CIO role, for example. The IT director is a little different. The IT director may not know anything about tech, but they need to know how to manage people. So IT director, people manager. CIO was the head information technology strategist for the organization. The cloud architect is someone that designs something just like the CIO, but they're a little more technical. So that's really the key. These architect roles are C-level executive roles. And here's the thing, RH, all executive roles are, CIO, are, are architect positions. So it's funny, after I left my enterprise architect role, I moved into a business architect role. You know who my customer was? The CEO. It was re-helping them design new business processes, the people, the processes, and the technology. It's very like it. What does the CEO do? He architects the vision of the business. What does the chief operating officer do? He architects all the systems to actually make the business work. What does the chief technology officer pick the technology? These are like CIO roles. The only difference is they're more technical. So the CIO might not know what a virtual machine is. That cloud architect better. The CIO may not know what BGP is or even heard of it or know how to spell it, but that architect better. So the, 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 and the reason the architect is so hard to get hired is you really need those CIO level business skills with the technology knowledge of how to design the system. But RH is much more like a CIO role than an engineering role. And that's where people get messed up. They confuse architecture and engineering, and it's much more like the CIO role. And instead of training to be that executive leader, they train to code or configure, yeah. which we don't do in our jobs. And that's why we retrain people. There's all these programs that are out there that are taught by engineers. They're called architect programs. And when people are done, they get a collection of silly certificates. <laughs> they learn Python, they learn Linux, and they get a bunch of certificates. In the end, nobody wants them. We retrain them all. Why? because architects are a lot more like the CIO than they are an engineer. More technical, that's the distinction. From Purnell, do you cover cloud resiliency, resil I can never say that word, that's resiliency cool. in your course? <laughs> of course we do, Purnell. Two years ago, we told everybody that you can't use a single cloud, it's a single point of failure, and if you need resiliency, you have to do this. Purnell, we make every student build a private cloud. Why? Because if they if you don't know what a cloud is, you definitely can't figure out all these other clouds. So yeah, we cover cloud resiliency. The things that we said two years ago, when we started this company, when I came out of retirement and, and to, 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 to build this, because I saw all the certified people that would never get hired and it broke my heart. We said, everybody must be multi-cloud. All our students have been multi-cloud. Guess what, Purnell? 98% of organizations are now multi-cloud because they know you can't build a single cloud that's high availability. <laughs> we also said that there was going to be massive engineering layoffs. We said it a year ago. You can see the videos on our channel. We said, move out of engineering and move into architecture. Move into customer-facing roles. Guess what IBM did? They canceled 7,800 positions. You know which positions they didn't cancel? Pre-sales architecture roles, and they didn't cancel customer-facing roles, just like we told you. A year ago, we said get out of engineering and move into architecture and the people that have done it, our students are still getting hired while there are people are getting laid off. And Purnell, to a year ago, we even talked about how not to get laid off, all the things that you needed to go. And if you go back to November of last year, we have chat GPT videos out there saying what's gonna happen to engineers. And guess what, it's happening now. So of course we cover these things. We cover that plus everything you need to know to get hired. If we didn't, we wouldn't have graduates working in AWS, Azure, Google, Capgemini, Deloitte, Accenture, yeah. KPMG, JP Morgan Chase, Barclays Bank, for example, the British Broadcasting Company, and I can give you, you know, a lot more, but these companies wouldn't be calling us. They wouldn't be sending people to our classes and asking for our people. They wouldn't be calling Chris and I to say, Mike, who do you have that we can hire? They do that because we cover all of these things and we retrain everybody else's graduates. 
from Shazad, it is easy to land a job from some organization, but difficult to find the good company among the weeds. Is there any advice for us to determine if the company is a good match before you accept an offer? Shazad, it's not hard to find a good company. No. If you've got a good resume and you've got good skills, you'll be offered good jobs. If what you got is a bunch of tech stuff, every job you're going to get is going to be a miserable job. I, I wish it wasn't the case, but yeah. it's sort of the truth. When you go on an interview, you're going to have you're going to be interviewing the hiring manager the same way they interview you. But Shazad, if you're asking us best about architecture jobs, what does the company's balance sheet show you? What does their financial sheet tell you? That's going to tell you a lot about their position. What's going on with their stock price? What's their PE multiple? What's their beta on their stock? CEO's job is to increase shareholder value. And their goal is to increase the PE multiples as well as the revenue. What's going on there? Organization losing money, organization gaining money. What are the analysts saying about that company? What are the insiders doing with their stock? Our architects are taught how to do these things because you can't get hard without being, but you need to be thinking about these things. What's the hiring manager say to you? When you give your presentation on an architect interview and you've got a lot of executives in the room, what are they saying to you? When you interview with the executives for the architect, what do they look like? What do they walk like? What do they talk like? you got to interview them. But if you're not looking at these things, you sure don't know. So look at those things. And Alonzo's muted again. From James T., most of, our, most of my work experience has been in healthcare, and I'd like to stay in this industry when I am an architect. Would that take away from my career opportunities focusing on a particular industry? No, I worked in healthcare architectures for years. I mean, the reality is I worked in banking first because it paid the most, because banks are so dependent upon the technology they can afford anything. You'll be worked with, there's some banks where a nanosecond of competitive advantage can give me millions of dollars a year. So they're willing to pay to get that nanosecond. But having said that, I worked in healthcare. In fact, I was the lead enterprise architect for basically Cisco's entire healthcare vertical. So, yeah, I spent a lot of time working in healthcare architectures. There's plenty of opportunities there if you know the industry. From Dean, have you ever heard of Skillstorm? If so, how does your course differ? And what certificates are you teaching students to achieve? I've just gotten Solution Architect Associate. Dean, here's what I know and I can tell you. When you can finish that course, you'll have a certificate. If you want to get hired, we can train you. And we'll have to completely retrain you. All these organizations teach the tech, how to configure. But guess what we don't do, Dean? We don't configure as architects. We design, present, and sell. So when you're done that, if you wanted to get a job as an architect, you would also need to get an MBA. You would need to get some executive presence training, some leadership training, some sales training, some emotional intelligence training, or you could take our course. So the reality is, yeah, I know who you're referring to. And I know what they teach. They teach hands-on tech, which is not what architects do. So if you've done this, now you've got an SAA. I want to know what your BGP knowledge is. I'll, and how would you design it? How would you design the IP addressing scheme for an organization that has 20,000 remote locations? How would you deal with an organization that's got 30,000 virtual machines? How would you deal with the organization's data lakes, for example? How would you deal with the organization's machine learning? How would you design their demilitarized zones, for example? How would you build a business case um, to show the customer that their billion dollar technology solution, which you just architected for them, is a good business value? And how investing in your thing is a better investment than investing in someone else? Mm -hmm. Dean, what kind of presentation skills training have you had? Um, what does the CEO care about versus the CIO versus the CTO, for example, that you might need to learn? So when you're done, you'll have a bunch of certificates. And guess what employers care about certificates, Dean? They don't care. They don't care at all. Nobody wants your certificates. The only thing you can do for them is you can use them to heat your house temporarily. If your heater breaks, you can throw them <laughs> in the fireplace. Yeah, now, it's, it's unfortunate. Yeah. We get our people hired, Dean. Now, we provide the training for the Azure Solutions Architect experts, which I don't care if my students take an exam or not, as well as the AWS Solutions Architect Professional. Again, I don't care if my students take it. we got people like Delroy Bat who got hired with zero certifications. But it's not about certifications. In fact, Dean, I had a guy, Arun, love this guy. He was one of my first students. He had all these AWS certifications on his resume, sysops and DevOps and all these other silly things. 
And guess what? Nobody hired him. He went on an interview after interview, and they complain nobody's taking me seriously. They keep asking me techie questions. So what did we do? We removed those certifications, and we remade his resume like an architect. But if you wanted to become a developer, they do do those kind of things. But um, when you're done that, if you want to get hired, we'll happily retrain you. Because architects don't configure, and all that training is related to cloud administration and not architecture. So kind of keep that in the back of your mind. We're happy to retrain you if you desire. From BD Too Easy, do you have any folks who went from help desk to cloud role? Yes. We've yes. I've been a help desk coming up on four years and beyond ready for the next step. I understand and understand your pain. I have some fundamental certs, Net Plus, Security Plus, studying for AZ 104. Okay, BD Easy, a couple things. One is we've got people with no background getting hired every day. I'll give you Daniel Bosu because he didn't even graduate high school and we got him hired. I'm also going to tell you that the Net Plus and the Security Plus don't belong on your resume. No CompTIA certification does. So here's the thing. If you're studying certifications, you will never get hired as an architect. You must learn to be an architect, which is about designing, presenting, and selling. So a couple of things. One is you've got to get past the brand of help desk because nobody wants help desk as an architect. Now, here's the thing in help desk, you may have learned how to communicate with people, how to get the right information and to communicate a solution that BD easy is very valuable experience. You got to be able to show that to people, show that to people. So again, that's really good. What are you doing to learn design BD easy? Cause you're not going to learn it in any Azure cert either. Because design is about solving business problems with technology. So, yeah, we get people hired. Look, I get people hired with no background every single day of the week. Like, Nyan was an example. He was a college student. Daniel Bosa didn't graduate high school. Uh, I, I, uh, I, I wish I had my list in front of me. But the point is that we get people hired every single day. But the key is it's not about certification. It, it's not about your experience. It's about your ability to do the job. Um, for example, but nobody cares about your certifications. It's about your knowledge. Yeah. Knowledge, 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 knowledge. So be easy. What are you doing to learn network design? What are you doing to learn data center design? What are you doing to learn multi-cloud design? What are you learning to do security design? It's sure not in the security plus, I can tell you that. Mm -hmm. And it's not in the AWS advanced security either. What, uh, what, what business challenges do you know how to solve? How do you lead a team of people? How do you sell? How do you build the business case? How do you give a presentation? Be easy. Those are the skills. You learn those skills, you will get hired anytime, no problem. But stop worrying about your certifications, worry about the actual knowledge. And also just another analogy is that you have a, <laughs> this is what I like to use. You have a, a loved one, they need critical care. You have a board of doctors. Uh, one doesn't say a word. He has a stack of certifications, slides them across the desk. The other one does not have any certifications, but provides a detailed list of experience that he's had working on prior uh, patients with the exact same concerns. And he talks about percentages of, how, of success rates, uh, where and how he likes to uh, implement the attack plan for that care and the overall healing process of your loved one and what they're going to go through based on dedicated research and, and prior um, documentation. Who would you go with first? Not the one who just slides certifications across the board. Um, this is the same approach when it comes to a list of certifications about I have AWS this, I have Google Cloud Platform that, or I've been certified with uh, a list of uh, Microsoft Azure certifications. So keep that in mind. Always think about what that person is wanting and how you're going to be able to fill that role versus what you have and what you want to get, give them. Exactly. And again, from James T, my current company has architecture opportunities. However, my current role is non-tech. Should I pursue an internal hire or look outside since my first impression would be as an architect? James T, I actually know you because you bought our course and haven't come to class. My recommendation is you come to class, you learn the architecture role, and then you start applying. Don't apply until you actually learn the job. That would be my strong recommendation for you. Agreed. 
until then, you're just going to go in an interview and you won't get hired and you're going to burn your name and burn bridges. So I recommend you learn the job first. Yeah. And this is from All Right. Do I need a degree to work as a cloud engineer? No. I just mentioned Daniel Bosa graduated, never graduated high school, and he's working as a cloud architect for the world's largest bank, JPMC. Nobody cares about your degrees. Nobody cares about your certifications. Nobody cares about your try hack me. They care about the following. Are you able to do the job and do it well? Yeah, that's your competency. They care about your attitude, your energy, your enthusiasm, your brand, your packaging, your willingness to go above and beyond your emotional intelligence, your communication skills. And whether you're a team player or not, they don't care if you went to school. Is it helpful? Sure. Do I love degrees? Yeah, absolutely. But, you know, I'd I don't have any degrees in tech. I got lots of degrees. I got multiple master's degrees. One's in nursing as a nurse practitioner. One's in business, yeah, but never in tech. And from uh, Shazad, would you pay a GCA PCA is a, would you say a GCA PCA is also a worth, worthless certification? Well, here's what I would say. Yeah. If you knew how to be an architect, you had the business acumen, the sales skills, the leadership skills, the executive presence, the networking, the data center, and the cloud knowledge. And then you took the exam in a weekend, which is about how long it would take you. It wouldn't hurt because it would be a nice thing to stick on your resume. But if you just did the Azure Solutions Architect Expert, the Google Professional Cloud Architect, and the, and the AWS Certified Solution Architect Professional, and you didn't learn any of those other things, you'd be staying in an unemployment line. So again, I would consider it that. So the key is with any certification, it's kind of like wrapping paper on a gift. You are the gift if you've got the right knowledge, the right capabilities. Now, if I'm going to give my wife a birthday present, instead of just handing her these shoes that she loves, which she put a list in the house and said, I'd like these shoes from Nordstrom, for example, please buy them for me. And she told me the exact shoe, the exact size. Instead of just going to Nordstrom, I wouldn't hand her the shoes. I would have them put the shoes in a box and put it on a, a wrap it up with wrapping paper and a bow. The GC, the Google Professional Cloud Architect is the bow. Nobody's going to buy an empty box with a bow on it. But if you put those really good shoes in the box, that the bow makes it look better. So I would consider that to be the bow that you put on top of the box that's got the actual present in it. Will it do anything for you on its own? Absolutely nothing. It's completely worthless on its own. If you have the right skills, that's kind of nice. It's kind of like me putting on a suit for the day versus wearing a t-shirt. I'm able to help my customers just as much with the t-shirt as the suit. But if I'm an architect, I better put on a pretty good suit before I meet the chief executive officer. It's like that. That's all it is. It's wrapping paper. If you put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. So make <laughs> sure that, the, that it's not a pig that you put lipstick on. Okay, again from Rosella Gold, with your course as a current Azure engineer with a AZ500 certificate, in my transition to become a cloud architect, should I specialize in security architecture? Rosella, it's up to you. What do you love? But I'm going to give you a real secret that can change your life forever. The bigger the impact that you can make on your customer, the higher the salary. So if I train you to be a cloud security architect, I might get you to about $300,000 a year after a couple of years of experience. I, we could do that. And I've got students getting $300,000 jobs. The problem is that's going to end there. If you focused more on the business as a generic cloud architect and more on your leadership sales, your sales skills, your executive presence, mm. you know, now you're into these half a million dollar plus architecture jobs. Or this is a senior director, but I had one that I showed you guys at 508 at Google. So the key is the closer you are to the tech, the lower your salary. The closer you are to the business, the higher your salary. So I ask you what you really want to do. If you love security, we can help you get a cloud security architect job and you'll be very happy. If you love networking, we can help you get a cloud infrastructure architect job. And again, you'd be very happy. But if your goal is to move into the C-suite or become a VP of architecture, I would stay generic. But no matter what, we can get you there. The key is what's going to make you happy. I've got some students that want to rise to the top. If they want to rise to the top, don't specialize in security. And why? Because, you know, security is just one element of the entire thing that that business needs.
Yeah. But if you love security, I think security is great. I had a student, Delroy Bat, for example. He was an EMT working on ambulances. A year in our course, and he's got a great cloud security architect job. And again, you can see a video of him on our YouTube channel, too, as well as lots of conversations with him. So the key is do what you love. But if your goal is a better, longer-term career, I'd say focus on being an architect, a cloud architect, with more enterprise architect skills, as opposed to just technical, or one technical like networking or data center thing. And that's really the secret. So I'd like to, to invite you all to the following. Please join us on Thursday for the completely free How to Get Your First Cloud Architect job webinar. We'll cover the role in depth, everything you need to learn. And then we'll spend upwards of an hour and a half inviting you to ask questions of our team. We can interview you if you desire. We can do anything we can to make you truly great. And it's completely free. There's a book in the an ebook, how to get your first cloud architect job right now in the description of this video. And I encourage you to get it right now because I want you all to get hired. And I know that Alonzo and I get pretty excited and passionate and because we want to get you hired. See, I know that I can get anybody hired that does the right things. And it saddens me that people spend all this time focused on all the wrong things. They collect certifications and they don't have the right skills. And see, the sad thing for me is, here's the key. I know that, that the average architect earns, earns $800 a day. I know a good one earns double that, $1,600 a day or more. And I know somebody spends a year learning the wrong skills when they want that $200,000 job. It cost them $200,000. So we're here. We're doing these conversations free so you can all have an elite career. So you can all get the jobs of your dreams. And you can change your family's life forever. I like to ask my students when they get hired, can you afford a new house and two brand new Mercedes? And almost everyone says yes. That's my definition of success. Change people's lives for three days pay for our average graduate. That's what we charge. Three days pay for our average graduate. That's our goal, to make a life-changing thing at the lowest cost possible. So join us completely on this completely free webinar on Thursday to learn how to get your first cloud job. We'll spend a half an hour giving you a detailed list of everything that you need to learn, how we train you. But that list, you can do learn those same things on your own. It won't be as cheap as if you did it with us because you're going to have to take some big spending courses to do it, but you'll know everything you need to to get hired. And then you're in control of your career. When you know what the hiring managers want, when you've got a complete list of the skills, then you're empowered to do whatever you want and get a job that will change your life, give you a lifestyle you can't imagine. And I can't, can't even begin to tell you the difference between an architect's lifestyle of freedom and respect and financial health, as opposed to the techie lifestyle of those people that are typing away all day long on their computers. I've done both, and I want you to have the best life ever. Lonzo, you want to say anything before we leave today? Oh, always. We're, we're definitely, we want to get, like Mike emphasized, we're not focused on certifications. We're not focused on you collecting another sheet, justifying that you know how to take an exam. Based on cloud service providers' perspectives, we want you to get the full scope of what it means to become a cloud architect, what cloud architects do, what the competencies and capabilities that a cloud architect must have to be successful. And we continue to do that on a weekly basis. Mike, Chris, myself, an awesome team, including Tyrone, Leo, Chow, Collins, um, so many so many people I can't even name, but, 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 but hate that I can't remember off the cuff because we are so impassioned by what we do and we are always ready to help everyone who is ready to get on that cloud architect trajectory, and we want to get them there as quickly as possible. So continue to join us on a weekly basis. We have Head in the Clouds tomorrow. We have so many opp opportunities, resources that, that we can't, I can't even name that we position and present to everyone uh, publicly, but we also have so many things that we devote to ourselves privately to our clients. So we encourage everyone, join us become a client of ours so that we can get you where you need to, to go as quickly as possible. Take care, everyone. Love the way you put that, Alonzo. Take care, everyone. Have a good one. We'll see you next time.